It's a chronic progressive fibrotic lung disease and unfortunately conveys a very poor survival with a median survival of around two to three years. These patients suffer from debilitating progressive breathlessness and cough. This condition is characterized by a usual interstitial pneumonia or UIP pattern of changes that we see radiologically and histologically. So if we look at the scans at the top, this is a normal CT, and what you see on the high-resolution <coughs> CT in an IPF patient, you see subpleural basal honeycombing on the lung. And then when you look histologically, you see the hallmark lesion, the fibrotic focus. And this consists of a hyperplastic epithelium, which overlays a collection of myofibroblasts. These are your key effector cells in IPF. They synthesize the extracellular matrix proteins that deposit into the lung, notably collagen, and cause the distortion in the architecture that you see in the CT scan. Now, there are many associations, environmental and genetic associations, of what causes IPF, but we don't know the direct cause. But we believe it's a, well, a result of a dysregulated program of wound healing. We get repetitive injury at the epithelium, which leads to apoptosis of the epithelium. This just then regenerates uh, into hyperplastic epithelium and then secretes a whole host of pro-fibrotic mediators, notably TGF-beta. There is then proliferation of uh, local and recruited fibroblasts and then differentiation into myofibroblasts. And this is marked by the de novo expression of alpha smooth muscle actin. These proteins then assimilate into stress-like fibers which gives rise to the contractile phenotype of collagen. And then these then secrete the excellent matrix proteins that we see in the disease. And it's the ongoing cycle and uncontrolled ongoing cycle of all these pathways that leads to ongoing fibrosis. Now, for many years, we used to give a triple therapy of steroids, azathioprine, an immunosuppressant, and N-acetylcysteine, antioxidant. But then in 2012, the PANTHER trials showed that we were actually increasing the mortality of these patients. So these drugs were stopped. But fortunately, in the last few years, there are two new drugs, perfenidone and entedanib, which act on inhibiting the pro-fibrotic mediators of the disease. However, even though these drugs can slow down disease, they don't stop disease, and there's a marginal benefit on mortality. So there's still really a need to find a new therapeutic target. So that leads me on to metabolic reprogramming in idiopathic polyfibrosis and disease. So this man over here is Otto Warburg. He is the German Nobel Prize winning scientist who in the early 1920s first observed that cancer cells preferentially diverted their glucose metabolism into lactate rather than into the mitochondria for oxidative phosphorylation, even in the presence of oxygen. And this was termed the Warburg phenomenon or aerobic glycolysis. And it was thought that cancer cells reprogrammed their metabolism to meet the biosynthetic needs of a proliferating cell. But we don't just see this change in metabolic phenotype in cancer cells. Scientists are now observing this change in metabolic phenotype in a number of cellular processes and diseases, from immune cell activation, aging, to heart disease, obesity, and diabetes. And now the connection between metabolism, diet, and disease is now coming to the public attention. So understanding why and how these changes are occurring will allow us to exploit these differences for drug discovery. So what's the connection with IPF or pulmonary fibrosis? So there were three pieces of data before I started my PhD that pointed us into the direction that metabolic reprogramming could be occurring in IPF. So Groves et al. at UCL here used FDG-PET, which is a known imaging modality in cancer, and utilizes the fact that cancer cells are glucose addicted by measuring the uptake of a glucose analog, FDG-PET. And they found that in the fibrotic areas of the lung, there was increased FDG PET uptake, suggesting that these areas of fibrosis or scar tissue were in fact metabolically active. And then Kotman et al. in America showed that there was increased lactate in the IPF lung tissue and increased expression of the enzyme LDH5, which converts pyruvate to lactate. And then Mercer et al. in our own laboratory showed the overexpression of the PI3 AKT mTOR pathway, which is a well-known regulator of a number of processes, including metabolism. And he found that there was increase in this pathway in the fibrotic foci in the lung tissue of IPF patients. And if you inhibited this pathway, you inhibited collagen deposition in vitro. So our hypothesis at the beginning was metabolic reprogramming is a critical requirement for TGF-beta-induced myofibroblast differentiation and collagen synthesis. 
The aims were to examine the effect of TGF-beta on glucose metabolism in primary human lung fibroblasts and to determine whether altered glucose metabolism was even required during TGF-beta-induced myofibroblast differentiation and collagen synthesis, and then to determine whether these changes were actually regulated by the mTOR pathway, which we know are to, is to be key in fibrosis. So this is our in vitro design of fibrosis. We have human lung fibroblasts, which we stimulate with TGF-beta. These then differentiate into myofibroblasts, which we can measure by uh, measuring the expression of alpha smooth muscle actin. And we can then measure collagen 1 as a measure of extracellular matrix deposition. If I draw your eyes to the mRNA profiles of the key phenotypic markers of myofibroblast differentiation and collagen synthesis, alpha SMAR and collagen 1, you can see that with TGF-beta, which is the dark blue line, there is a significant increase in the mRNA levels of alpha SMAR and collagen 1 from 12 hours to a peak between 24 and 32 hours. So we want, when we wanted to measure metabolism, we first wanted to look at glucose uptake. This is effectively the first rate-limiting step of glucose metabolism. So we want to see what happened during differentiation. So using NMR, we measured the amount of glucose in the supernatant um, once we stimulated with TGF-beta. And you can see that from eight hours, there is a significant depletion of glucose from the supernatant with TGF-beta from eight hours, which continues over 24 hours. So increased glucose uptake during differentiation. And we then wanted to see when we, uh, when the myofibroblast had differentiated and was then fully synthetic of collagen, uh, what happened to glucose uptake then? So using tritiated 2DG, we measured the amount of glucose uptake in the cell. Uh, and we found that there was a fourfold increase in the amount of glucose in the cell. We then wanted to measure glycolysis. So the image here is a very simplified image of glycolysis. Glucose is broken down via 10 steps into pyruvate. It can either go into lactate or oxidative phosphorylation. So lactate is a, a marker of glycolytic flux. And using a colorimetric assay, we measured the amount of lactate in the supernatant with the cell stimulated with TGF-beta or not. And you can see that over 24 hours during that process of differentiation, there is a significant increase in the production of lactate. And this continues to increase till 40 hours once the myofibroblast is differentiated and is fully synthetic of collagen. We then wanted to see whether the key, phen the key I suppose, facilitators and transporters of glucose metabolism were increased on an mRNA level. So we looked at GLUT1, which is the most commonly expressed glucose transporter in the lung, and we could see that the mRNA levels were significantly increased with TGF-beta were at 24 hours. We then looked at hexakinase 2, and you can see that, uh, well, hexakinase 2 uh, catalyzes the first uh, rate-limiting enzymatic step in glycolysis, and there was a significant increase with TGF-beta from eight hours. And then we looked at PFK-FB3, which basically catalyzes an offshoot of glycolysis, but the product, fructose-2,6-bisphosphate, acts as an allosteric activator of glycolysis and so stimulates glycolysis. And you can see with TGF-beta, there is a significant increase with TGF-beta from three hours at a very early time point. And then we looked at LDHA, which is the enzyme that converts pyruvate to lactate. And you can see that there is a significant increase in the mRNA levels of this enzyme from eight hours. We then want to look at mitochondrial respiration, and we can use the Seahorse platform to measure oxygen consumption rate as a measure of mitochondrial respiration. And you can see with TGF-beta that there is a significant increase in the basal uh, oxygen consumption rate compared to unstimulated cells. So summarizing the data so far, we can see that glucose metabolism increases during TGF-beta-induced myofibroblast differentiation and collagen synthesis with increased glucose uptake, increased lactate production, increased expression of the key facilitators of glucose metabolism, and increased oxidative phosphorylation. But we now want to see whether these changes are actually needed for the phenotype of differentiation and collagen synthesis. So to interrogate this question, we use 2-deoxyglucose, or 2-DG, which is a glycolytic inhibitor. It is taken into the cells just like glucose and is not metabolized any further after the hexakinase step. So effectively acts as a glycolytic block. And then we used a um, macromolecular crowding assay, which is high content platform, to visualize and quantify alpha smooth muscle actin and collagen 1 expression. 
So you can see with the images here, with TGF-beta, you get a significantly higher amount of alpha smar expression in a stress fiber formation compared to without TGF-beta. And then looking at collagen, you see extracellular de deposited collagen in a matrix formation with TGF-beta compared to uh, without TGF-beta. Then you add the glycolytic inhibitor, and there is a dose-dependent inhibition of alpha smar and collagen-1, which is mirrored by the images. We then wanted to see whether if we modulated glucose metabolism, could we inhibit the TGF-beta-induced increase in the alpha smar and collagen-1 gene expression. So as we expect, at 24 hours, with TGF-beta, there is a significant increase in alpha smar and a significant increase in collagen-1 gene expression. We add 2DG, the glycolytic inhibitor, and there is a significant depletion of alpha smar and collagen-1 gene expression, suggesting to us that the changes that we see on the protein level may actually be guided by an effect on the transcriptional level rather than an inability to produce protein. So the interim summary is that glucose metabolism increases during TGF-beta-induced collagen synthesis and differentiation, and this increased glucose metabolism is a requirement for the acquisition of the myofibroblast phenotype. So we then wanted to see whether mTOR regulated this metabolic reprogramming that we see during TGF-beta-induced myofibroblast differentiation. And as I mentioned before, the PI3AKT mTOR pathway is a key regulator of metabolism and has been shown previously to be key in fibrosis. So what we did was we wanted to see whether the changes that we see in metabolism were regulated by mTOR. We had a previous clinical research fellow who went further to interrogate the axis, and she found that if you inhibited mTORC1 and mTORC2, a dual inhibitor, which is highly selective, you were able to inhibit the gene expression of collagen 1, sorry, alpha SMAR, and collagen 1, and in vitro, you were able to inhibit the extracellular deposition of collagen. So we use the same inhibitor in our metab metabolism readouts. And this graph basically uh, shows a ratio between the lactate in the supernatant to the glucose in the supernatant. So effectively gives you a glycolytic flux uh, measure. And you can see with TGF-beta, as we expect, there is a significant increase at 24 hours. And then we add the mTOR inhibitor. This is significantly depleted without an effect on baseline. And then we saw whether this actually had an effect on mitochondrial respiration. And you can see that when we add the mTOR inhibitor, there is a dose-dependent inhibition on TGF-beta-induced increase in the oxygen consumption rate with no effect on cell count and no effect on baseline. So in summary, increased glucose uptake is a hallmark and a requirement during TGF-beta-induced myofibroblast differentiation and collagen synthesis. And these changes in glucose metabolism uh, are regulated by mTOR. And hopefully, targeting metabolic reprogramming may represent a novel therapeutic strategy in IPF and potentially other conditions associated with excessive collagen deposition and dysregulated mTOR signaling. Our future aims are to, first of all, define the mechanism by which glucose metabolism and 2DG influence myofibroblast differentiation. We believe it's not just a carbon requirement and an ATP requirement. Glucose metabolism has been shown to affect uh, TGF signaling and also gene expression. And we also want to examine the effect of TG, 2DG and the mTOR inhibitor in our in vivo model of fibrosis, which is the bleomycin mice mouse model and identify possible metabolic biomarkers of disease and also uh, disease resolution. And not in the breadth of this PhD, but we would like to assess the effect and efficacy of glycolytic modulators in a proof of mechanism trial using the 18F FDG PET as a readout. And I wanted to leave you with a number of clinical trials that are now targeting metabolism. Now, the beige box on the right <coughs> is um, the cancer field, and their strides ahead, and their number of clinical trials targeting different aspects of metabolism. But outside cancer field, there is a, uh, a, a multi-center trial in America targeting, 2D, targeting intractable epilepsy with 2DG, and also a um, glycolytic inhibitor in pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I'd like to say a big thank you to my supervisors at CITA, Professor Rachel Chambers, Dr. Paul Mercer, and Demetrius Anastasio at the Crick. I'd like to say a big thank you to my colleagues at CITA, especially Ilan Azuelos, who did the seahorse work at GSK.